Now let's see this point again, but in a different way. Suppose we have a population, all UCSD psychology majors, and suppose we know some parameters about this population, that the average age is 19.8, the average IQ is 110 and a half, and we have 65.1% female and 34.9% male students. Now, I'm calling these parameters because I'm calling the population all UCSD psychology majors. So if I know these values are true for all UCSD psychology majors, then these are simply the parameters of the population. Now imagine we take a sample from this population, the first sample, with Mike, Tom, Jennifer, Andy, and Lucy. So these are just five individuals from the entire population from all UCSD psychology majors. Suppose I calculate the same statistics. So I find the average age in sample one, it's 21.8. I find the average IQ, 106.2. And in this sample, notice we have 40% female and 60% male. And before I go on, notice that these sample statistics aren't matching the population parameters. And this should make some sense intuitively. We just have a sample of five individuals from the population, so we shouldn't have an expectation that those five individuals will perfectly represent the population. Now let me take another sample, sample two. Jake, Laura, Tiffany, Sarah, and Anne. Completely different people, and they'll yield different sample statistics. So in sample two, the average age was 19.2, the average IQ 112.2, and in this sample, it was 80% female, and 20% male. Now let me take the population parameters and sample statistics and put them side by side. And I want you to notice the differences between the parameters in the population and the statistics in our sample. Notice in terms of age, the population was, in truth, having an average age of 19.8. In sample one, we got 21.8 as our average, and in sample two, 19.2. Neither were the same as the population, and each sample didn't even agree with each other. Now, in terms of IQ, again, we see that our samples differed from the population. And in terms of the proportion of males and females, notice our samples differed quite a bit from each other and also from the population. So there is a discrepancy between the statistics in our samples and the true population parameters. Now, this has a name in statistics, and this is probably one of the most important concepts in all of statistical inference. That discrepancy is called sampling error. And sampling error is just the discrepancy or amount of error that exists between a sample statistic and the corresponding population parameter. So again, the difference or the discrepancy between the average age in the population and the average ages in each of our samples, that's sampling error. That difference is due to the fact that we took a sample and we shouldn't expect samples to have exactly the same statistics as the corresponding population parameters. Now, we call this error in statistics, but it's not an error like you did something wrong. This is error that is present in all statistics and all samples we take. Sampling error is an ever-present feature of sampling. We will always have some discrepancy between the sample statistics and the population parameters. Now, this discrepancy is due to chance alone and chance will be something that we will be able to understand or grapple with via probability. And remember, we already saw a situation where chance alone was causing discrepancies between different statistics. This was actually when random assignment was used. Remember, we said that it ensured that there are no systematic differences across groups before treatment, and I told you that groups will differ due to chance. Now this chance difference is going to be sampling error, and that difference or discrepancy between the samples will be totally due to sampling error. And sampling error will be something that we will be able to quantify and understand. Now let me give you some insight into why sampling error is a problem. Certainly we know it's present, we know it's going to happen, but why would this be any problem for our research? So let me go forward and let's go back to that simple experiment where we had the population of all UCSD students. And remember, I said I was going to randomly assign 50 to get caffeine and 50 to get no caffeine before an exam. Now I showed you before that the average for group one was 79 and the average for group two, the one that didn't get caffeine was 75. Now this difference between these two might be due to the caffeine or it might be due to sampling error. Notice we have two explanations of the difference that we need to deal with. 
the first possible explanation is there is actually no effect of caffeine on test scores, and the four-point difference we observed is due to sampling error. That's possible. We don't know how likely it is that sampling error would cause a four-point difference yet, but we can certainly say that that's a possibility. We know that sampling error will be present in any samples we take, so if we randomly assign people to groups, that's like taking two different samples, and those sample statistics won't necessarily agree with the population or with each other. So that four-point difference could be due to just sampling error alone. Now, a second possible explanation, and probably the one that we want to be true if we're doing this study, is that there is a real effect of caffeine on test performance. Now, this four-point difference won't be due just to the effect of caffeine. No matter what, we're going to have sampling error. So in the second possible explanation, we're actually saying that there is a real effect of caffeine and we've observed some sampling error. But in explanation two, we're adding an explanatory unit. We're saying that caffeine has some effect in the world. Now, before we go any further, let me pause and talk about this first explanation because it represents a significant and important explanation in all of science. This is the explanation of maximum parsimony. You may recall Occam's razor, entia non sunt multiplicanda pretere necessitum, which means entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. In science, we want to choose the simplest possible explanation that can adequately explain the data. This is just the economy of succinctness or the law of parsimony. And good science will not multiply entities or add additional explanatory units to the world if there's no reason to. So, this first explanation is the one that we have an obligation to consider, one that we can only reject if we can show, in some way, that a four-point difference would be unlikely to be due to sampling error. Now, let me restate this point because this is critical. If we can show that sampling error wouldn't reasonably cause a four-point difference in these two groups, then we will have some means to reject that first possible explanation. And if we can show that sampling error alone is not the reason that the difference exists between the groups, we'll have some reason to multiply entities, to add an explanatory unit, to actually say that there is some real effect we've measured in addition to the ever-present sampling error of the world. Now we'll come back to this point because this will be a critical piece of the logic of hypothesis testing. Every hypothesis test, in essence, is an effort to discredit that first explanation in science. We want to show that sampling error alone is not the cause of the differences we observe. In science, though, we have to consider that first explanation, and we have to accumulate sufficient evidence so that we can be confident that the first explanation isn't the actual explanation in the world.